But today I want to talk about something, a new series called Baggage Claim. So Lori and I went on vacation. Thank you so much for, for uh, praying for us while we were away. And we went on a cruise, which is, you know, I didn't, it was a COVID cruise. as I didn't want that to be the case. You know, you hear all the news and all this other stuff. We were on a cruise ship that was 100% vaccinated, except for the kids 12 and under who couldn't be. They were COVID tested many times. We used uh, precautions, the whole, the whole thing. But going there, we knew it was going to be an eight-day event. And so I know that they have laundry services on the ship, but that didn't stop me from packing for 16 days of clothes, you know? Like, you had the morning, and then you have to wear what you wear for the, for the evening thing, and and so we show up at the, at the place, and I have my, brief, my, my suitcase. Lori has her suitcase. We have, I have my, my briefcase. Lori has her carry-on bag. We have the garment bag, and I have a bag of snorkel gear. And I'm walking, like, carrying all this stuff, and I see a porter, he goes, oh, sir, come over. And I'd never pay somebody $10 more happier in my life. Here you go. Take it all. And I was able to walk on the ship. Of course, I was covered in sweat, covered in sweat. Didn't help that I'm there with a mask on and just warm. Have you ever felt that way? So finally get on the ship. and I'm like, oh, dear Lord. And I realized that sometimes in life, we all carry baggage and we all become exasperated by it. We all get pulled down by it. And today I want to talk to you about finding the porter to give your baggage up. And so it all happens. Life, you're not born with baggage. Babies aren't born with baggage. Babies are born free. It happens as we progress in life. When life happens, baggage happens. People start doing things to us or saying things to us, and all of a sudden, you have a bag. Maybe it's relationships, and it might not be a lot of baggage, and and you can manage it. You learn to compensate with the baggage that you have. And then more stuff happens to you. And then before you know it, you have even more baggage. (laughs) And then you think, this is just the way it's always going to be. I was made to carry these bags. Don't you know it's in my blood that we are a a, a strong kind of people and we are made to carry bags. Listen, God didn't make you to be a pack mule. Amen. He never intended for you to carry that luggage. But we think it's the way it's always going to be and we get stuck into it. And ultimately, the choice becomes ours. Either we're going to continue to carry the baggage or at some point, we're going to let God take it all. And that's what we're going to do in this series is help you understand where to let go and let God. Um, The one thing I don't like about traveling is luggage. I really, I love to travel. I don't like the luggage part of it. I hate going to baggage claim and waiting and waiting and waiting. And people are jostling like if they, they get closest to the entrance of where the bag is coming off and they can get and they're saving 30 seconds, and they're jostling, and they're full of anger and angst, and oh, that's the worst part is baggage claim, I think. But to avoid baggage claim, most people just do a carry-on. Very good. It's, it's really a no-hassle way to flying. If you can fit it in a carry-on, it's a whole lot easier. You just get off the airplane and get back on. The same is true in life. Most of us are carrying these, these uh, carry-ons because we don't want to claim it at baggage claim. But the first, start, first step of getting rid of our baggage is understanding what we have. You have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge the baggage that you're carrying. So let me ask you this question. What baggage are you carrying? Ask yourself the question. What baggage am I carrying? It probably comes in one of these areas. Number one, through unfulfilled expectations. If you're taking notes, it's in there. Unfulfilled expectations. One of your bags could be unfulfilled expectations. Something that you expected to happen didn't happen. And maybe you've experienced that in life. And Proverbs says this in Proverbs chapter 13. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is the tree 
of life. Some have a very unrealistic view of life. They want earth to be heaven. My friend, if, that is your, uh, if that's your thought, we're going to be sorely disappointed. We want heaven to come to earth. We really do want that. But if we believe that we're going to, we should be living in heaven, we're going to be surprised by the amount of hell that's around us. And so we live in this constant state of disappointment and kids we train our kids to live this way as well. We train our kids to, to think everything's going to be good, and we should train them more to be tough than to be naive. We should toughen up. For instance, we shouldn't give them participation trophies for coming out and playing. And the coach says, amen, that's right. It's not the real world. You don't go to work and your boss goes, oh, thank you so much for coming in today. Never once. And if you do, keep that boss, because that's a fantastic boss, or they have issues. Uh, so either way, it's unfulfilled expectations is one bag. Another bag that we could have is untreated pain. We've been hurt in the past, and it's untreated. By far, it mostly comes from the wounds of other people. Other people have wounded us. Wounds that we try to blow off. We try to say, oh, that's not a, a, a big deal. But the truth is, it was. You ever have somebody lie about you or say things about you or hurt you? You know, Moses, uh, Moses Joseph had his brothers throw him in a pit, try to kill him, sold him into slavery. Then he went, he was, he was working as a slave in the master's house and his, the master's wife tried to say that he raped her, kicked out of the house, going to jail, working in jail, interpret dreams pretty soon. Like, what in the world is going on? Well, God rescues him, puts him in a place of prominence, and then the same brothers who sold him into slavery come before him. And he doesn't dismiss it. He doesn't say, well, it's okay. I know your heart. He doesn't blow off the pain. He acknowledges it. What you meant for evil, the Lord meant for good. The saving of many nations, Genesis 50, verse 20. And so whatever happens in your life, don't, dis, don't disregard the pain. You have to understand that that pain is very real, otherwise you won't be able to get rid of it. There won't be healing. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14 says, they dress the wound of my people as though they were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. So, so not only do we have unfulfilled expectations, not only do we have untreated pain, maybe another bag that we carry is unresolved yesterdays. Our yesterdays are not resolved. We're still, we're still focusing. There's not an end to that chapter. It's still open. It's still taking RAM out of our computers, mental computers. We don't understand why it's happened. It's because we haven't resolved it. Conflicts that you never resolve Delay then becomes the issue, not the conflict. So if I have a conflict with my wife and I don't settle that conflict with my wife, now it's no longer the conflict that is the issue, it's the delay in dealing with that. And then I get angry and then I, I, I build up walls of resentment and it can go on for years and years and years. That's why the Bible is very clear. It says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with it. Close the chapter. We all have unresolved yesterdays. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And don't give the devil a what? Foothold. That's going to be a very important thing in just a moment. Remember that word, foothold. Things attach so easily to us. Have you noticed? Sometimes it's like Velcro. Sometimes you're walking. You remember those? You ever walk through, the, the, through a... a um, a meadow or, or, or go through a, a, a forest and all of a sudden you get those stickums on you. You know what I'm talking about? The ones where you touch them and you, ah, Lord forbid that's in your shoe. Those, those hurtful things. And it seems like in our life, we pick those up. We don't understand how they happen. It just happens. It's part of life. But the key is we need to get it out of our body. My wife has a uh, um, splinter in her foot. It's been there for some time, 
she can't get it out anymore. So now she has to see a podiatrist to get it out because if it was taken care of first day, it wouldn't become an issue. It doesn't fester. And many times our unresolves fester in our lives. We need to settle our issues quickly. I, you know, early in life, I'd re- I resolved not to carry around emotional baggage. I resolved I'm not going to. I've seen what it has done to people. You know, they're, they're, the, the Chinese proverb, I don't know if it's actually a Chinese proverb. They said it's a Chinese proverb. It could be somebody else, but said that a wise man learns from their mistakes. An even wiser man learns from others' mistakes. And a fool learns from neither. And so I want to be a wiser man. I don't want to have to go through the pain that other people go through. I want to look at the pain and go, oh, that's something I want to avoid. Maybe instead of going this way, I'm going to go that way. Amen. And so in my life, I saw emotional baggage as something that I didn't want to carry at all. So I don't carry unforgiveness. I don't carry envy. I don't carry jealousy. I have a very, very small rear view mirror. I'm not looking in the rearview mirror. I'm looking at the windshield ahead of me. I need to settle my issues quickly. Forgive, turn the other cheek. I wear this life like a very loose garment. So yesterday I went to have, and I know it's a, I know it's a sucker's thing, but um, you know when you have a warranty on your car and they say, okay, you're going to come and do service every 15000 or whatever, and so I drove in, and my service place is over in Deland, which is a drive, an hour, hour 15. And I get there, and the guy says, well, how do you like your car, Mr. Rums? I said, I like it. I just wish it was taller. I wish it was an SUV because it's tough for a big man like me to get in and out of a short car. Matter of fact, I look like a clown trying to get out of a car. Or a bear, a bear getting out of a small car. That might be it. And she goes, oh, well, let me talk to your advisor, your sales guy. I'm like, oh, here we go. So he said, you know, we happen to have, we we don't get, we get like three things a week and we happen to have one come in. I think I have the car for you, Mr. Rome. Same color, just it's an SUV. I'm like, oh. And we're giving more on the trades than your car is worth because right now we can't get cars in and people are buying the used cars and we're selling them at a premium. I said, oh. (laughs) And so they talked and I got for the same amount of money the new car for my old car. I said, okay, praise God. And so I got done with a finance guy and I'm going out and the guy says, Mr. Rome's, I'm sorry, but I just did a walk around and I noticed there's two spots that during delivery, something must have scratched on this, these plastic parts. And uh, we ordered the parts and when you come back for that window tinting, we'll have them and we'll replace them. I said, okay. He said, you're not angry? Why would I be angry? You didn't hide it from me. You told me what it was. You told me what the solution was to fix it. I can't do anything about it. What is anger going to solve in this problem? He said, I wish most of my customers were like you, Mr. Rones. And I said, well, I resolve not to carry the emotional baggage. You hear what I'm saying? Now, I, one time in my life was not like that. That's what I was telling Lori when I told her the story yesterday, that at one time I would be angry. I would be red-faced. I would be the guy, what do you mean? You saw my best. Ah. It's amazing how walking with the Spirit of God over many, many years will change you to be more in the image and likeness of Christ. And so, my friends, don't carry this emotional baggage and then be surprised at what Holy Spirit's going to do in your life. Amen? So, not only do we have those those baggages, but the last one is we have an unhealthy view of self. (laughs) An unhealthy view of self. Have you noticed that? Have you ever heard of the negative self-speak in your mind? Have you ever, if you were to vocalize all the negative things that you say about yourself, I think you'd be surprised. I really think you would. You wouldn't let somebody talk to you that way, yet you allow yourself to talk to yourself that way. So I didn't really understand this. One day I was was with some coworkers and we were doing a cornhole, which is, for those who don't know, it's when you take a beanbag and you throw it into a hole. 
it's a sport. And so we were doing this sport, and as I'm throwing it, the guy next to me goes, what are you, what are you saying? I said, what do you mean? He goes, you said, come on, man, you can do this. Oh, a little bit to the left, you got this. And I was speaking to myself like a coach would. I was coaching myself up. It was positive speak, which was different than the negative speak. The negative, you idiot. You couldn't hit that hole if you tried. What are you even trying this for? You know, there are better people at this. And the problem is that we have these voices inside of us telling those things. I do not give the negative me permission to speak. It can't talk. I don't allow it. Ah, 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 ah. It starts talking. Ah, ah. Stop. I allow the Spirit of God to speak inside of me. So allow that in you because an unhealthy view of self, you will compare yourself to other people. And when you compare yourself to other people, you are saying, God, you didn't make me good enough. So I golf. I try to golf. Once a month, I go golfing. And I remember I get up to the thing at T and I want to be like Tiger Woods. I'm going to hit it 300 plus yards right down the center. I'm going to be great. And then I go and I can't even hit it past the ladies' tee box. I have a witness, <laughs> a couple of them. And I'm like, what in the world happened? Well, I don't play golf enough. I don't do this. And I, you have to put good expectations on yourself. I don't practice for eight hours a day playing golf. I don't want to. I don't want to have that as something in my life. I love to golf. I don't want to golf that much. I don't even want to eat that much. You know, I, like that's <laughs> surprising. Um, but our self-esteem sometimes can burn us out and, and make us carry these bags. Others become totally obsessed with themselves. Have you seen this? Just look at their Instagram account. It's all... <laughs> they're all these things. And you're going, man, you are all about you. They're unhealthy with that. They, when I told my, my son, and we were having a conversation, I told him as a student, and now as an adult, he quoted verbatim what I said back to him many, many years. So son, what I found out in my life was when I looked at, when I was young, I thought everybody was looking at me. When I got older, I realized everybody was concerned about themselves and weren't really looking at me. They were dealing with their own stuff. And once I realized that I can't please you all the time, chances are I can't please you half the time or a quarter of the time, I'm just going to be the person that God made me to be and live in that. It changed everything in my life. That was that was at age 35. At age 35, I found wholeness because I found out who I was. And part of it is going to be next week when you do that, that assessment, it said, oh, this is how God made you to be. I went, oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I was trying to be like that other pastor that I worked for, that other person that I knew, and I liked that about them, but I wanted that. But God didn't make me to be that. God made me to be me. He made me to run my race. I'm not to run your race. I'm to run Jerry's race. Otherwise, we get an unhealthy view of self. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. I love what it says in the message. It says, the only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us. Not to be, uh, not by what we are and what we do for him. Many people think if I do enough for God, then he'll accept me. My friend, there is not enough that you could do by your own actions for God to accept you. There's not enough. The Bible says, your righteousness or your good deeds are like filthy rags before God. There's not enough that you could do. It's almost like another way of saying it would be like your good deeds are like a dirty diaper. Here, God, look at the dirty diapers. We're supposed to do good deeds, but that doesn't make me a believer. It just shows that I am a believer. You hear what I'm saying? We put the cart before the, the horse. The last one is this, unrepented sin. Unrepented sin is going to be a big piece of baggage that will hang off our necks and drag us down. Almost no one bears a heavier load than the carrier of personal secrets from the past and the present. Let me say that again. No one carries a heavier load than the carrier of secrets from the past and the present. Psalm chapter 32 says this, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, 
your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as the, sun, the heat of the summer. Selah. What does Selah mean? Think about it. Think about it. That's what it means. Think about it. You got to do it like that sing song. Try it with me. Think about it. So I kept silent. My bones were wasted. I'm holding all these secrets. I'm groaning. God's convictions on this, his life. And because that conviction and holding on and not repenting, it saps the energy out of you. And you're wasted down. So it's unconfessed, unrepentant sin. You said you were sorry, but you didn't change your direction. Listen, repenting doesn't mean saying you're sorry. It's part of it. It's, I was heading this way. I was doing this. You're not supposed to do that anymore. Oh, so I'm going to do an about face. I'm going to go the other direction. Yes, I'm sorry I was doing that. And I'm no longer going to do it anymore. And so many times, though, as believers, we continue on doing the same thing over and over again. And we're sorry, but we're not repented. And if you want to feel real change in your life, change the direction of what you've been doing. When the Holy Spirit tells you, you're doing the wrong thing, sister, you're doing the wrong thing, my brother, then you say, okay, God, what is the right thing? And I'm going to walk that way. Can I get an amen? So how do we check the baggage? So how do we get rid of it? The most freeing part of that bag, I told you, was that porter who came and took my bags away from me. In this series, we're going to talk about the emotional, the physical, the addictions. And today, I'm going to give you a foundational truth for it all. The Bible word for baggage is the word strongholds. Let me let that sit for a second. The biblical word for baggage is strongholds. And many, we were just talking about some things, and you just said, yeah, I have that, yeah, I have that, I have that. And the Bible says when you allow that into your life, you allow a stronghold. And it's the one area that always stays with you. Have you noticed like you have this one thing that always stays with you? This one bag, no matter how many times you put it on the conveyor belt, you pick it back up. Oh, I like that bag. That's my favorite bag. I, I like the way it feels around my neck. I like the way it, but it matches my shoes, you know? It, and you carry this bag and you wonder why you're not moving forward in life. Second Corinthians chapter 10 says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. We're not fighting with M16s. On the contrary, they have divine nature to demolish strongholds. The weapons that God has given us to fight with will abolish the strongholds that have been holding us hostage for years. And the devil doesn't want you to hear this message. He wants you to be distracted thinking about what's for dinner. He wants you to be distracted thinking about a hundred other things other than how to demolish strongholds in your life. Because as long as he can keep a stronghold there, he's going to stop you from living the John 10, 10, the full life that God has. So how do we do this? Well, the definition of that word stronghold is huge, and it's a Greek word. It's ochoruma. I've been practicing that all week long. You got to put like a phlegm in your mouth. Ochoruma. It means a prisoner who is locked by deception. I'm deceived. I'm, I'm a prisoner by my own deception. It means living a life that is not true. I'm living a falsehood. I'm not living truth. I'm living my thing. Satan's biggest plan is to get you stuck in deception. It's his greatest tool, and it's also a lie. See, the baggage comes from the lies that we believe, and that's why the next verse says, in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive most of our thoughts. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You want to change your life? Change the way you think. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're not convinced, here's one more verse. 
Ephesians chapter 4, 22 and 23 says, you were taught to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. So in this series, you're gonna hear a lot, a lot of truth. And your job, my job is to preach it, your job is to believe it. Why? Because John 8, 32 says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You wanna get rid of a stronghold in your life? Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I'm gonna give you three truths real quick, praying right now that God, his, his people would be set free today. That's what my prayer all week has been. Matter of fact, this was written before I left been praying the whole time that before I, when I got back, God, that your Holy Spirit would be working in people's lives, that they would hear this truth and their lives would be changed. So you're not here by accident. You're here by a Holy Spirit set up. He wanted you to hear this word because the deceptions have been messing with your life long enough. And he says, I want my people to be free. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty I'm free at last. And when we can say that, I really believe that we'll be able to change not only our families, but to change our communities, be able to change our state and change our nation. It happens when we become free people. So how do we do this? These are very simple, but they're very, very positive. Number one, you gotta know that God still loves me. He still loves me. No matter what I've done, there's nothing that I can do that would separate God's love from me. He loves me. Religion has lied to too many of us. Even though we read the Bible, even though we know the Bible, the religion says you have to prove it. Prove it to God. And we carry around the shame and the low self-worth because we can't prove it to God. The worth is something that is, how do you know what something is worth? Something is worth whatever you're willing to pay for it. I would love to think that my house is worth a million dollars. But unless somebody is willing to write a check for a million dollars, it's not worth that. It's only worth what somebody's ready to write a check for. So, what are you worth? John 3, 16 and 17 says this. This is how, from the message, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his only, one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go through all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help. That is good news, my friends. God loves you. And as soon as we start believing that, we'll be free. The second thing, you gotta believe that God can free me. He can do it. It's totally within his realm of stuff, of possibilities that he can do. I know this is gonna be tough for some of us to believe because we have the low self-worth that we're fighting with. Why would God ever wanna use me? Why, who am I? Why would he even look in my direction? Some of us feel lower than the belly of a pregnant ant. It's pretty low. We say, how could God of someone like me. We've bought into this lie, but Romans tells us this. You no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that good news? If we stop right there, it would be great, but there's more. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air freeing you from the fated lifetime of betrayal tyranny, a brutal tyranny by the hands of sin and death. Don't lose hope. This can happen. Pastor, you don't know how long I've been struggling with this. I don't care how long you've been struggling with it. One word and you're healed. There was a woman who was struggling with the issue of blood. She couldn't stop bleeding as a woman for 12 years. And she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And she reached out and touched him, and Jesus said, ooh, I felt power go out of me. And she was immediately healed after 12 years. Don't tell me he can't do it. He's done it in the past, he's done it for me. The person who I was before Christ and the person who I was after Christ, completely different. 
Completely. I have a witness in the front row, my wife. She led me to Christ. Completely different. Don't tell me he can't do it. Don't lose hope. It can happen. The third one is you got to believe that God will not only free me, but he'll, number three, restore me. He's a God of restoration. To heal you is good. To restore you is better. And God wants to do that. He wants to make you innocent again. He wants to make you pure again. But pastor, <laughs> you don't, don't know. I don't, I don't want to know. I'm not your priest. Don't confess it to me. Confess it to Christ. But he will completely change you from the inside out. Psalm chapter 71 says this, though you've made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again from the depths of the earth. You will bring me up. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I know that we have a room full of people who God's working on right now, saying, God, I need you to love me. I need to know that you love me. God, I need to know that you're gonna save me. You can free me. And that you're gonna restore me. Make me innocent. Make me pure again. Remove the years of pain and damage that the enemy has caused. As we have a God who does that, we have a God who can do that in a second. Just, just be gone. Just peace coming right now into this room. I can feel the peace and presence of God, even in this room as we're speaking, that God came to offer this to you today. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. You've been sitting for a mighty long time. I'm going to ask you to stand up to your feet. We're going to pray together. It all starts with asking Christ into your life. It, that's how it all starts. I don't know where you are in your walk with God. I don't know. I, I don't know. But I do know he does. You and he have been having a conversation. Maybe you've been the whole service. You felt this pull on the inside. It's so the easiest way I can describe it. But I got to do something. I got to do something. There's a change needs to happen. That's how I feel it. I don't know how you feel, but that's how I feel. God, I need to be changed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start in a prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Can you pray with me? Say it like this. Jesus, Lord, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me for living life my way. Today I invite you to be the Lord of my life. Take control of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Give me the power to change. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I just want to say congratulations, and you meant it from the bottom of your heart. The Bible says that you are a follower of Christ. And how about this? How many people, you said that prayer, and maybe for the first time, or you meant it for the first time, and today you say, I today became a follower of Christ. If that's you, I want you to slip up your hand real high and say, Pastor, I made that decision to follow Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? I made a decision today. I'm a follower of Christ. I am not going to be the same ever anymore. I've been changed. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, man. I've been changed in Jesus' name. Awesome. Guys, I am so excited. We have a book for you. I'd love to hand to you at the end of service. I have the Connect desk. Uh, it's a green book. Make sure you pick it up on the way out. It's our way of helping you walk in Christ and explain what just happened to you. Uh, we have more coming, but that's what we have now. Guys, I know that God is going to do amazing things in your life. I know it. I'm so excited for this week for you. Could you imagine what your week's going to be like now that you know that you can be set free, that you can walk in wholeness and freedom and not have to carry those heavy bags anymore? Can you imagine what this week is going to be? Could you imagine the joy and the peace and the happiness that's going to flow through your life because of Christ and his name? Let me pray over you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May you be blessed in your coming and in your going. May he make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. May you experience all that he has for you this week. 
May you walk in his power and his strength and his majesty. May you see his face every day as you seek his face every day. May you experience his power instead of yours in everything that you experience. May you be able to give the love of Jesus Christ to all those you come in contact with. All of this giving glory to God our Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray and declare it. Amen, amen, and amen.